So let's let's talk about training. Firstly, what makes a good goalkeeper? Uh, are we talking physiologically or are we just talking in general? If you could put it into a bowl, it would make a goalkeeper. Whichever way you want to take it, what's the <laughs> one for you? Um, as I said earlier, put your sense of a screw loose slightly somewhere. Um, you don't want it to be too loose that they are, you know, making rash, rash decisions, but it's that sense of being fearless and not being worried about getting conked with the ball. Um, I also think physical attributes, you need to be powerful. Um, it doesn't matter what size you are in sense, in my opinion, you still need to be able to be explosive at the blocks, whether that be over the five yards or to make a change of direction. Um, and you need to have... I'm trying to think how to phrase it. You need to have a brain on you that can't think. One of my old coaches at Leicester told me once, he's like, you're the worst person ever when you think. Because by the time that I think about doing something, the moment's gone. If you react on instinct, then it happens. There's no kind of conscious bias behind it. Whereas if I go, oh, I need to, oh, it's gone. It's happened. The ball's gone in, the pass has been, or, or, or whatever's kind of happened, if that makes sense. But that sense of nearly living on the edge and going, working on instinct is the most important bit, I think. There's a fantastic book, which uh, regular, regular listeners of this podcast might have heard me mention before, uh, Bounce by Matthew Said. Um, I think it was this book where he talks about when you're learning something, it's fun to brain, you have to think about it, and, and the, the reaction is therefore slower. It's uh, when, you, when you meet a foreigner whose English is technically very, very good, but only lived in the, has only lived in the country for a couple of months, they don't feel like they're speaking the language very well. Yeah. Because it's all front of brain, it's not subconscious. When it's subconscious, it becomes instinctive. Definitely. It's all about skill acquisition, isn't it? And how it becomes that ability to execute your skill without thinking about it. You know, whenever I coach younger goalkeepers and you coach them about diving, the concept of just throwing yourself at a ball, a hard little ball, isn't there in a lot of young people's brains or not there in most people's in the world's brains, unless you're an idiot like myself. Um, so to kind of put that normality into your head and go, actually, that fear barrier of absolutely launching myself after that ball has gone. It's, if that's there, you're not going to do well. As soon as that drops, you you reach a new kind of skill level, if that makes sense. Like a new ability of, of how to react to situations. So how do you train for that? How do you, how do you coach that? How do you learn that? You, you can try and coach as much as you like. So breaking down the skill completely. So if you're looking at diving, we're looking at starting on knees and collapsing down and things like that. And then it's kind of trying to, the way I like to phrase it again is, is not thinking. So as soon as I think about diving, it doesn't happen. If I see a ball flashing past my head and I'm absolutely, you know, on the edge of, you know, I've played on my execution is really good. I'm having a good training session. You know, you pull out these, you see these keepers pull off these absolutely incredible saves because they are on the edge of, of where they should be. They're on the absolute peak of arousal levels. If you're looking at psychology and sports, like theories behind that, and they're able to pull off things they shouldn't be able to pull off normally. It, it's just about learning how to get to that level of kind of anxiety, if that makes sense anxiety and arousal and being able to control it and there's plenty of theories and kind of um traits behind it all but it's just knowing and being able to get yourself to that area but also regulating it and not losing your mind as such so what does your training regime look like as as uh, a top grade uh a goalkeeper do you train differently for indoor hockey to outdoor hockey uh, not really, no. Um, so from a from a, a pitch training or a court training perspective, um, you know, outdoors we would train twice a week, so Tuesday, Thursdays, um, weekend match days as well. For indoor, that supplements in towards or would be supplementing year around now. Um, so we would have one or two training sessions a week, depending on where we were with the outdoor season. So as the outdoor season tapers down for the Christmas break, we would then add one session in, one session in bits and bobs into there and then tapers up towards hopefully finals day um so for example last year we trained on the saturday morning prior to the sunday finals um which a few of my colleagues were a bit like oh that's a lot that's a lot you're doing isn't it but actually for us to have that ability to go out and play just get some minutes in your legs for the girls who are playing outfield and to get a bit of touch in and kind of it breaks down 
breaks down a lot of what was being hyped towards the day. Um, so yeah, you know, physiologically that works there. Um, if we're looking at training off the pitch, um, we have, we're really lucky. Um, we have an s &C, Mark, who is so knowledgeable and provides so much information for us. He it, sends through, it, say it again, sorry. s and is that strength and conditioning? Yeah, strength and conditioning. So he sends through um, regular kind of plans for us. Um, at the minute, we've just moved on to something called lean tissue development, which is a lot of gym work, a lot of explosive based stuff. So the gym programs are the same. It's the conditioning, the running stations that are different for goalkeepers and outfielders. All right. So a lot of our field players, they won't really know. They'll go off and do their, their movement training or their sort of uh, positional awareness training outfield with target games and passing games and so on. And keep us a go off in, 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 into the little cage with the tin on <laughs> yeah. uh, and just tennis balls and they go, oh, weird people, what are they doing? What are you doing? What and, and Are we talking about pre-game here or are we talking about uh, like uh, uh, pre-training pre or? Tuesday, Thursdays. Tuesday, Thursdays. So, uh, so to break it up even more, our Tuesday nights are typically, um, we call them academy. So our juniors play beforehand, train beforehand. A lot of the girls, including myself, do a lot of work with the junior section. So we do that to start off. And then we go to academy. So we normally start that off with a running session. Uh, the outfield girls would do their session. Goalkeepers would do their own session. So we're all going to do that on our own time. We then get kitted up, padded up or whatever. And Tuesdays are predominantly looking at skill-based. So for goalkeepers, lots of shots. Lots of shots, lots to do, small-sided games, um, you know, game at Buckingham that we love to play called Chaos, which is kind of continuous back and forth from the corners, really high intensity, um, kind of like a, a burner, if that makes sense. So it's a, right, throw everything out there, have a bit of fun, work on the things we're not great at in an environment where we aren't going to lose out on, if that makes sense. I mean, training's still grossly competitive. Um every single week they're always kind of got little clickers to determine what teams won and if there's a contentious decision it's kicking off and everything which is really nice to see um then we go to thursday nights which is normally video analysis so assessment before the weekend and then we go into predominantly game-based stuff so things that are looking more towards the opposition for the weekend but also looking towards how we as a team can improve our own principles 